Hey guys, Spirit of the Law here. I know everybody's really stoked to learn more about the four new civilizations in African kingdoms, but in a way it looks like we really got five new civilizations, because the Indians seem like a different, much better civilization than they were back in Forgotten Empires if you look at all the changes that have been made to them. I did my Civ overview on the Indians a few months ago, and they did seem a bit underpowered, and that was the general consensus, but it seems to have been addressed when African Kingdoms came out. This is the changelog from the African Kingdom expansion, and look at all those changes to the Indians. It was a pretty major overhaul, and I don't know if conclusions made about them before really hold up anymore. This video is going to take a look at the Indians in light of the changes, and a series of tests to see what kind of effect these are all going to have. Let's check them out. So the first major change wasn't actually listed directly under the Indians, but it's that camels are no longer treated as ships for the purposes of building bonus damage. I can't emphasize enough how much that impacts the Indians, especially being a civilization without knights, and they rely on their camels to fill a similar role. Comparing camels and knights directly, as I did before, it looks like the camel line and knight line match up pretty well for HP, with camels having slightly lower base armor and attack, but also a cheaper cost. Before though, camels were awful against town centers, castles, and towers, and they regularly took double the damage that knights did against those buildings. It was a trade-off between their bonus against cavalry and their weakness to building fire. Now before the updates, and if you're still playing without the new expansions, early Imperial Age camels took 70 damage from a town center with 10 villagers in it per shot, while knights took only 21. Now under the same conditions of having all the castle upgrades, the town centers do 42 damage to camels and still 21 to knights. Okay, so it's still not that great. This is also with regular camels, mind you, and not the slightly better Indian ones. Well, if we use the Indian camels, which gain plus one melee and pierce armor as a sieve bonus, we finally still take 35 damage per shot. The thing is, that's still pretty terrible. So what's going on? If we investigate, a knight with two pierce armor takes three damage from a tower with five attack. That's all normal and exactly what should happen without bonus damage shenanigans going on. A camel with no pierce armor though is still taking six damage from a tower with five attack so it seems like there's still a lingering bonus damage against them. The main idea here is that camels don't take absurd damage anymore, but that doesn't mean they're on par with knights. They not only start with two less armor than knights, but even with equal armor they always take one more damage per shot. I'll let you draw your own conclusions about whether this change is enough to make camels a useful raiding unit or not, and especially once you factor in their cheaper cost, but I'm still going to be careful with my camels around castles and town centers, and I still wouldn't say they're on the same level as knights. Now let's take a look at a tweak to one of the Indian Civ bonuses. They've always had cheaper villagers that got increasingly cheap as the game went on, but an additional 5% has been added to all of those discounts. Now villagers start at 45 food in the Dark Age and progress right up to 38 food in the Imperial. You're free to disagree with my numbers here, but just for an illustrative example, let's say you're doing a Black Forest map and you go up with 25 villagers to feudal and you make a few villagers, then you head up to castle and boom with a few more town centers, making 50 more villagers, and then hit Imperial and make some more, ending with 120. You'll probably end up deleting some of those villagers to make room for trade carts or whatever, but let's see the impact of the Indian cheaper villagers in this theoretical build just to have some numbers to talk about. Well for every other civilization, it's just a straight 50 food per villager, so adding up all those costs means a generic civilization will have spent 6,000 food total. If we fill in the row now for the Indians, taking into account their cheaper villagers each age, we end up with a bit over 4,800 food. That sounds pretty good so far, but why don't we break it down by age. If we look at it that way, we see 94% of those savings come in castle age and later, since that's when the discount is greatest and you're creating the most villagers. 125 food in Dark Age isn't a bad bonus, just in isolation, but we also have to think about the diminishing value of food over the course of the game when we talk about a thousand or more food that they're saving. One thing we can certainly say though is that this is much better than it was before the additional 5% change, especially in the early portion of the game where the savings are more than double what it used to be. 
We're talking about a net 300 more food in total, but most importantly, around 75 of that new food is coming in the Dark Age. Personally, I like this change. The next one is that they receive the technology guilds. This was something that I even called out in my last video. I do find it a bit interesting that the Indians don't get access to guilds. It just feels like something they would have to approximate the Saracen's market bonus. Of course, I'm a fan that this was added. One thing though is to bear in mind with guilds that you need to use it a lot for it to be worth the investment. Assuming the market crashed and it's 14 gold for 100 wood or 100 food, that means the 300 food and 200 gold cost of the technology guilds itself is worth about 242 gold. Since every 100 resources you sell after guilds gives you 3 more gold, we need to be selling more than 8,000 food or wood post guilds to recuperate the cost of the tech. The point is, don't be too quick to research the technology unless you're very sure that you're going to be using the market a lot. I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of people think this technology pays off faster than it really does. The next change is that the Indians now receive ring archer armor. I like this change as well because their archers really did look good otherwise, so it's a nice tech to get, and it puts them on par with other civilizations with surprisingly good archer tech trees, like the Japanese. For me, the biggest impact of this change is on the hand cannoneers, which now have the unique tech of plus one range, and they get all the armor upgrades. Before the update, it was a trade-off, and while they did beat normal hand cannoneers with their extra range, that will most definitely be the case now, and we can have a legitimate discussion about them joining Spanish, Turks, and I guess Portuguese as having the best hand cannoneers. And the Indians desperately needed a buff to their best anti-halberdier unit, since it's such a great counter to the camels and elephant archers the Indians are going to be using, and the Indians always lacked good siege to deal with infantry effectively. Speaking of elephant archers, they got a massive overhaul, with four of the seven listed changes applying specifically to them by name. The first is that the Castle Age Elephant Archer has plus 30 HP. I didn't look at the non-elite version last time, but let's compare it to the new one and the War Wagon. The new Elephant Archer has one less Pierce armor but 30 more HP, so it's actually pretty similar to before statistically. It is outpaced in terms of attack by the War Wagon and has an identical attack rate, but double the HP. Like I said in the last video, that can be a bit misleading though, since it takes about double the damage from pikes in the Castle Age, and they end up being equally ineffective. Plus, they take more damage from elite skirmishers in Castle Age. So what I'm saying is the extra health disappears kind of quickly, and once you factor in the weaker attack of the Elephant Archer, it's still just a weaker war wagon for more gold. Sorry guys, I hate to say it. The next change is that the Elite Elephant Archer has minus 20 HP. Now this one's a little confusing, and it doesn't stack with the plus 30 HP for the non-elite version. And the fact of the matter is the Elite Elephant Archer just has less HP than it did before. In the previous version they could have up to 370 HP in post-imperial, and now it's 350, even after bloodlines. I'm a little confused about this one because I wouldn't have said it's running the risk of being overpowered before, and it's still 270 HP less than the Elite War Elephant. There's a few more changes coming up though, so let's not look at this one in isolation. The next is that the Elephant Archer gets minus one Pierce Armor. You might be wondering at this point if the Elephant Archer is actually getting weaker. Well, not necessarily. This is technically being balanced with the Archer Ring Armor being added, which adds plus one melee and plus two Pierce Armor. So it ends up giving them actually one more Pierce Armor than they had before. And it's a net positive for every other Archer that now has more armor than previously possible. The last one is that the Elephant Archer line now costs 10 less food, so it's now 100 food and 80 gold. To me the limitation was, and still is, the gold cost, but a bit of food off is okay too. To me this was a whole lot of changes, but when we look at them, the Elite War Elephant is surprisingly basically the same unit it was before. They're still not as tanky as War Elephants, so they're not great in the front lines, and hiding them in the back doesn't make a whole lot of sense, since an Arbalest can perform that role better with longer range and costs a lot less. If anything, Arbless have even been buffed by having more armor, which makes the Elite War Elephant even more questionable in that role. As I've said, I compared them to the War Wagon last time, and I concluded that both function in a similar role as late game archers, with low unit turnover and resistance to anti-archer units like onagers and skirmishers, but Elephant Archers end up performing slightly worse than the War Wagons in a variety of situations. I would say all of that is still true. And all that the changes have done is basically shuffle the last archer armor tech into the tech tree without having the side effect of buffing the elephant archer at all. 
It's one more armor, 20 less HP, 10 less food cost per unit, and now you have to pay for the Archer Ring armor tech in Imperial Age instead of being built into the Elephant Archer stats for free. So despite what I thought heading into this, the aspect of the Indians that seem to be changed the most is actually almost identical. I guess that's why you have to look at the math. One more thing I want to mention before I end the video is I'm sorry about how slowly I've been making videos this week. The scenario editor has been fighting me a bit since the last update, and honestly Fallout 4 looks so tempting. Ah, fuck it. See you guys in three months.